Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Joseph Hyatt. He's standing in for Gayatri, who, I'm grateful to announce, gave birth to our son, Torin, earlier this week. The Mafia, the Cosa Nostra, our thing, has much in common with our current ruling class, except the Mafia usually drew the line at murdering women and children. But when it comes to plunder, extortion, corruption, and the casual deployment of violence to achieve their ends, well, the Mafia are just the roughest end of capitalism, a kind of naked free enterprise. Originating in Sicily and moving big time to the United States, the Mafia have been with us for well over a century. Immortalised on film, glamorously in the Godfather epics, less so in Goodfellas, not at all in The Sopranos, the word Mafia has become a byword for organised crime of all ethnicities. The Chinese Mafia, the Kurdish Mafia, the Kosovan Mafia and so on. Joining us now to discuss the original Mafia is historian, TV presenter and international best-selling author, Professor John Dickey. His books include Mafia Brotherhoods, Cosa Nostra, which I've read, and his latest, Mafia Republic, which is going to be a very big film. Professor, thanks very much for joining us. So, nice The Mafia, <laughs> what is it? Is it The Godfather or is it The Sopranos? Uh, it's very much more The Sopranos than The Godfather. I mean, The Godfather is where most people start, but the thing The Godfather film gets wrong um, is that it mistakes family in the sense of uncles, cousins, and so on and so forth with family in the mafia sense, which is really a metaphor, a metaphor for the organisation itself. And they kind of borrow the idea of the family to bind their group together. Really, mafias are systems for exploiting families rather than being blood families in, in the sense we normally understand. So little in the way of honour, not that there was very pure honour in The Godfather, but at least they pretended or maybe even thought that they were held together by a kind of honour? Um, well, honour, certainly not in the sense we understand it in this. You know, the mafias have always killed children and women and whatever, and they've always also uh, talked to the, to the police and the state whenever it suited them. That's, you know, that, that there's, uh, there's no honour in that sense. But honour in the Mafia sense does exist and has been part of their way of doing things since they began in the middle of the 19th century. And honour essentially means a kind of criminal pride. It's, uh, honour is kind of law for those outside the law, mm. in a way. So they begin in this uh, smallish island uh, at the foot of Italy, but they become international bestsellers. Mm. Uh, this achieved presumably by their rather large immigration to the United States. Well, we need to be clear, that one of the things behind this, this new book, one of the arguments behind this book, is that to really understand the Mafia, as in Cosa Nostra, the Sicilian Mafia, we need to understand that it's actually only one of three major criminal organizations in Italy. And today it's not even the most powerful. The most powerful is widely reputed to be the Andrangheta, which is the Mafia of Calabria. Calabria being the toe of the Italian boot. Uh, and what my new book does is tell the story of these organizations in parallel, in the way that they've related to one another, learned from one another, occasionally fought from one another, and above all, had variants of the same relationship to the Italian state. But you're right, yes, it, in, it, uh, as far as Cosa Nostra is concerned, it's the link to the United States uh, that really projected it onto the world stage. But the most successful of the Italian mafias that's spreading around the world is the Andrangheta, the Calabrian mafia, the one that nobody can pronounce, few people know little about. The Andrangheta has had a presence in Australia, for example, since at least 1930. Wow. It's in Canada, it's in Germany, it's in northern Italy. It's easily the best of all of the mafias at setting up little colonies uh, around the world. 
I know a lot of Italians, and none of them strike me as criminal beyond anyone else's criminality or, uh, or even violent beyond anyone else's potential for violence. What was it about Sicily, Italy, that made them so good at organised crime? Like a lot of societies in the Mediterranean, they've got a lot of problems, you know, with building a state. Particularly in the South, Italy's institutions have always been fragile, always vulnerable to corruption and patronage politics, clientelism, that kind of thing. But the real spark that sets the mafias off, the reason why southern Italy, as opposed to lots of other societies that have the same problems, has mafias, is to do with a link to politics, to do with a link to political violence above all. And it's no coincidence that the mafias are about as old as the Italian state. Italy, founded in 1860, Garibaldi and all that, that's when it first became a unified state. And that, pro that process of uniting Italy was a process of revolution. It was a, it was a violent overthrow of a, a monarchy, the Bourbon monarchy in southern Italy. And the conspirators who took part in that revolution needed revolutionary muscle. And they recruited that revolutionary mus muscle amongst the criminals, particularly when they ran into them in prison. And many of those conspirators were members of sort of Masonic-like secret societies. It was a good way to do politics when you were conspiring against uh, a, a regime like the Bourbon monarchy. And so they recruited those criminals into their Masonic organizations. And if you want a, an easy definition of what a mafia is, it's not uh, a criminal business. It's a, a Freemasonry of criminals. It works like the Freemasonry. That's really the key idea to keep uh, in your head, really, to understand how the mafia works. Now, going back to the 1930s, maybe earlier, the United States set up all manner of uh, crime-busting outfits, untouchables and all of that. Did they ever get on top of this? Yeah, I think the United States has made, uh, as has uh, Italy incidentally, made important progress in recent years. Um, I mean, famously it took the FBI until the late 1950s before it actually decided to prioritise uh, the fight against organised crime and recognised that the Mafia actually existed. It had other priorities, no notably fighting Reds under the bed, uh, for example. But the key moment came in the 1980s. Sicilian Mafia essentially controlled the supply of wholesale, wholesale heroin into the eastern United States. And this led, in Sicily, to an extraordinary outbreak of violence as well as a heroin epidemic in the United States. And uh, literally hundreds, thousands killed in the worst Mafia wars in history. And the state finally responded, creating legislation and a kind of law enforcement infrastructure that was up to the task, you know, 150 years too late, if you like. And slowly, slowly in recent years, progress has been made, despite some appalling setbacks like the murders of heroic investigating magistrates Giovanni Falcone and Paolo Borsellino in 1992. Um, the Sicilian Mafia uh, is in the worst state that it's been in its whole history. Really? Yeah. It's, uh, it's certainly not beaten. It's a long way from being beaten, but its historic leadership, apart from one uh, man who's still on the run, is all behind bars serving uh, life sentences. In the United States, they, they had the... Uh, Famously in The Godfather, the go the, the, one of the uh, co senators, I think he was, comes to the wedding and so on. And in the Italian state, they were particularly close to Christian democracy, weren't they? That's right. It's really the, the Cold War froze Italian politics for 50 years. Italy had the biggest communist party in Western Europe, couldn't be elected. Um, uh, the biggest in the sense of electoral support. And this gave the Christian Democrat Party monopoly access to power and the favours of the church and so on. And in southern Italy, the Christian Democrat Party was, uh, whole, was very seriously infiltrated by organised crime. Think back to that definition I gave you of mafias as being like the Freemasonry for criminals, uh, okay? Inherent in the, the 
Freemasons is the idea of crossing class boundaries. Yeah, my grandfather was a Freemason. He laid cobblestones in Edinburgh for for a living. Yeah, he was an ordinary working man. Whereas at the same time, members of the royal family are members of the Freemasons. It cuts right across the hierarchy of social classes. And the Mafia is exactly the same. You'll find thugs and aristocrats, businessmen, politicians, awful lot of doctors and lawyers. Uh, we, we shouldn't be surprised uh, at any point in the Mafia's history to find that political and uh, entrepreneurial element uh, within the Mafia. Professor, you obviously raised the fact that the Mafia very much capitalised on the Freemason model of going across all the social spectrum. Um, obviously, we see amongst young people today that the Mafia kind of typical film image, if you like, is very much favoured as a fashion. Uh, do you think that resonates with the Mafia as in its true form in Italy? That's probably true outside of Italy. I think, I think it's fair to say there's no doubt that a film like The Godfather trades off a certain glamour. You, if you break that film down image by image, it's all about us getting the frisson of identifying with Michael, who's, a, you know, who's the bad guy, you know. But in Italy, things play very, very differently. It's only really in certain very limited environments close to the Mafia you know, the Mafia does command its own area of support. The Mafias command their own area of support in society. That's absolutely true. But broadly speaking, Italian, th that idea, th the idea of glamour just doesn't play the mm. same way in Italy More at Tony all. Soprano, you know, this is, this big is, fat slob than Michael Corleone. Uh, very very much so. I mean, you know, these are people who, who kind of dissolve children in acid and stuff like that. You're not going to, you know, there's, there's not, not much you can it's do to glamour. yeah. glamorise people that. like that. Yeah. Professor, it's been absolutely fascinating been great talking to, to you. Here. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Coming up after the break, it was the left's finest hour. And if the others had listened to us, the Second World War could have been averted and almost 100 million people saved. We're talking the Spanish Civil War. Don't go away. Welcome back to Sputnik. When a fascist putsch was launched by General Franco in Spain in 1936, it could have remained a little local difficulty. Instead, it became a dress rehearsal for the Second World War. Emboldened by their success in Abyssinia, earlier, the new fascist powers of Hitler's Germany and Mussolini's Italy promptly threw their weight behind the attempt to destroy the democratic Spanish Republic. The Western democracies stood idly by. Indeed, they imposed an arms embargo on the legitimate government of Spain. As Hitler's air force dive-bombed the ancient Basque capital of Guernica, reducing it to ash, a crime immortalized by Picasso in his painting of the same name. Nazi guns and material flooded into the fascist Franco forces as they steadily advanced, murdering all in their way. Only the then Soviet Union came to the aid of Spain. They and the huge international citizens army of volunteers who came from all over the world and came to be known as the International Brigade. The failure of the Western powers to halt fascism in Spain led directly to the series of Hitler provocations elsewhere in Europe, in the Rhineland, in Czechoslovakia, and which started the cataclysm of the Second World War. It is hard to imagine a higher price which could have been paid for folly. Joining us now to discuss the Spanish Civil War and the British volunteers who fought in it is Dr. Richard Baxel, historian and author of Unlikely Warriors, just released in paperback, a story which weaves together a diverse array of testimony to tell the remarkable story of the Britons who took up arms against General Franco. Dr. Richard, thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, just paint the picture, if you will, of what kind of British people joined the International Brigade, went to fight in Spain, and what did they find when they got there? Well, overall, there were about two and a half thousand people from around the British Isles and Ireland. And contrary, contrary to a lot of people's idea of the, of the International Brigade, they're actually overwhelmingly working class men and some women from major, the major urban areas around Britain. So London, Manchester, Merseyside, Tyneside, huge number from Scotland, from the South Wales uh, mining areas. So they're very much working class. Of the left, the majority of them were Communist Party, but it wasn't just Communists, it was all of the left, from the Labour part, from Labour right the way through. Um, and they went to Spain because they'd seen the advance of fascism across Europe, 
uh, in their own country, of course. Many of them had battled against Mosley on the streets of Britain. And they were determined that in Spain they would draw the line and fascism would, would get no further. Most of them, I think, knew very little about Spain when they left. They were looking, they, they knew more about Britain and Germany and Italy. So when they went there, they had very, li very little Spanish. They didn't really understand what to, they didn't know what to expect in many ways. And what they found was a brutal civil war in which the General Franco's forces were being, as you said in your introduction, supplied with huge amounts of arms and material from the fascists around the world. And they had a very hard time in Spain. I think there's no way you can get around that. Of the two and a half thousand from, from the British Isles that went to Spain, over a fifth of them were killed, and very few of them left Spain without some form of injury. Interesting the uh, class point that you make, because insofar as it's remembered today, uh, oftentimes it's thought that uh, because famous authors like George Orwell, poets like John Cornford, and other people from the intellectual circles uh, did go to Spain. Mm. It's imagined that it was an army of writers and poets, but it was mainly miners and boiler makers and shipyard workers. Yeah, exactly. So, but that's that's in a way that's as you expect because the middle class volunteers were the ones in the main who wrote the who wrote the memoirs, who wrote the books, and middle class people talk about their their, their own kind. The narrative no. Uh, has, in my view, uh, been defamed, essentially. What ought to be hailed, and I still hail it as the left's finest hour, uh, has become poisoned, really, by uh, twin attacks, uh, although with one source. Uh, the liberals, people like Christopher Hitchens and others, uh, attack the International Brigade and attack the Spanish Civil War as being some kind of communist and Soviet uh, crime against the people of Spain, when I believe the opposite is true. And then there's the classic standard Trotskyite narrative that argues that if only the Soviet Union, the dead hand of the communists, had not been on the struggle, it could have been won. What do you say about that? Well, I, I don't agree with that. I think that without the Soviet Union, uh, the Spanish Rep would Republic would have been defeated much earlier than it was. Now, Stalin may have had his own reasons for supporting Spain, and they may not all have been about uh, uh, standing up for democracy, but nevertheless, there's no doubting that without the huge amounts of material, uh, with the, the organization of the international brigades themselves, it's, it's quite likely that, that, that the Republic would have de been defeated in 1936, let alone 1939. So no, I, I don't buy with that hypothesis at all. The International Brigades were not, they were not sent there to suppress other parts of the left. There were elements that were involved in that in internecine struggle, it is true. But the, most of the, the people that I've talked to who went to Spain from the International Brigades spent most of their time fighting in the trenches around Madrid or in, in, Madrid or in, the, in the mountains of Aragon. They had, they had little time to be doing anything else but, but apart from trying to save their own lives, to be honest. Unla uh, unusually, Spain had a very large anarchist movement. Uh, which, of course, was in the war and fighting the fascists. But as the name suggests, anarchists are quite difficult to organize, certainly difficult to uh, unite uh, with uh, others. How much was that dichotomy uh, responsible for the failure of the defense of the republic? It obviously played a part, but I think I think it is overplayed. I mean, to be the f to be fair to the anarchists, you couldn't really expect them to support uh, a, a social democratic republic and a, a centralised government. That's not that, that that's not that what they believe in. And they supported the government in 1936 mainly because they'd given an they were given an amnesty in the election, but also because they realised that that uh, the that the put, the coup was directed as them at them just as it was directed at everybody else. But I think what really counts, the reason the Spanish Republic lost was not because of the, the problems and the arguments in the left. It was the fact that there were 80,000 Italians in Spain, there were 20,000 Germans, there were 75,000 Moroccans, and with everything that came with them. That, to my mind, is the crucial problem that the Spanish Republic faced, I, I, not I the problems know, in I Barcelona. I didn't know those numbers. 80,000 Italians? Yeah. Essentially, it, essentially, 
Italy was at war with the Spanish Republic. And the Western governments not only did nothing, but actually imposed an arms embargo, as Joseph said in the introduction. Sure. Well, the Western governments were more, they were looking to appease the dictators. The last thing they wanted was for the Spanish conflict to expand in, into Europe. So they did pretty much everything they could, in their opinion, to try and limit it to Spain. If they could sacrifice Spain so that it would be wider peace in Europe, then they were prepared to do so. If fascism had been confronted by the Western democracies in Spain in 1936, 1939 and the Second World War might not have happened. What do you think of that thesis? I tend to, as you probably wouldn't know, historians hate those kind of counterfactual speculations because we spend all our time trying to work out what did rather than didn't. But I think it's a difficult point to argue against. You know, if, if the dictate, if if Britain and France had stood up to the dictators earlier, I think the likelihood is that the situation would have been very different. Yes. Uh, Doctor, obviously, I think the wider public at the moment in this century have been very uh, disheartened by the loss of life in the Middle East. But obviously, mm -hmm. I've heard reports that in the Spanish Civil War, there were some 500,000 people murdered or uh, in fatally injured. Um, it's, it's unimaginable, isn't it? Mass loss of life. There was a huge loss of life. And it should be remembered, it's, it's often forgotten. But people were being killed and continuing to be killed after the Spanish Civil War, because after the Spanish Civil War, there was a dictatorship in Spain, which lasted until November 1975. And people were still being garroted not that long before the end of the dictatorship. So it is a, yes, it's a, it's a terrible tragedy. Mm -hmm. And thousands and thousands of people lost their lives, lost their livelihood, were imprisoned, went into exile. Yes, it is, it is as one book called it, the Spanish tragedy. In my uh, first Labour Party conference in Blackpool in 1974, the then Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, made a public appeal to stop the garroting of three Spanish political prisoners in 1974. I know. An appeal which failed and they were I think the last uh, garroted, hideous form of execution uh, by the dictatorship. How has Spain fared since the passing of Franco? Well, uh, there was, in, some, in many respects, the transition from the dictatorship to democracy was remarkably peaceful. I think most commentators expected there to be bloodshed of some form. But there was an agreement in Spain that there would essentially be a pact of forgetfulness and people needed to move on and put the past behind them. And that really, uh, that really lasted for perhaps a generation or maybe two generations. But now it's starting to break down. While the children of the, of the people who fought in the Spanish Civil War were, were willing to, to maintain that pact, the grandchildren are less willing and they want to know what happened to their grandparents. So there's an increasing desire within Spain to find out about what happened and to relearn the history. Because of course under the dictatorship, the history that they were taught was Franco's vision, version of, of events, which is very different from everybody else's. Now, Spain is of course facing difficulties of mainly economic, but Spain is, is in, in a difficult place. They have huge problems with corruption. They're financially in deep trouble. So it's very difficult to work out what's, what the future for Spain will be. But this chapter uh, that is wonderfully brought to life again in your book, uh, Unlikely Warriors, is uh, almost without uh, comparison. We're talking about a battle in which Hemingway and Jack Jones and George Orwell and even Mr. Attlee, uh, briefly, Clement Attlee, the Labour Prime Minister after the Second World War, and ten scores of thousands of ordinary workers uh, who left their unemployment queue mainly in the 1930s, some of them their jobs, uh, to go and fight uh, in a country of which they knew little, but for a cause that was dear to them, Dr. Richard Baxter. Thanks very much indeed. <laughs> And now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Joseph? Well, on the subject of the Mafia, uh, a great one here from Gordon Horsepool. Um, 
there is a few I would like to see swimming with the fish. And on the Spanish Civil War, Muswat says, by comparison, Occidental peoples today equal very weak-spirited, largely due to decades of conditioning in conformity. And a bit of a controversial one from Amy Wyatt. She says, if Tories were in power in the 1930s, they would probably ban people from fighting for communism and socialism in Spain. I would say that a direct comparison is people travelling to Syria for jihad, but that seems to be illegal. Well, illegal and wrong. Uh, the International Brigade were going to fight for a good thing in Spain. The people that are going to Syria are going to fight for a bad thing. I think one of the uh, reasons why uh, it might be more difficult to have such an International Brigade today is that uh, people know all too much about war and what happens there now. Bear in mind, in 1936, Nobody even had a television. So these people were going to a Spain they knew little about and were being in, uh, thrown into the front line of a very bloody and brutal uh, civil war. Yes. Any more or is that us? That's all we've got time for this week. But follow us on Twitter. It's RT underscore Sputnik. Or check us out on Facebook. It's Sputnik on Russia Today. It's goodbye from me, Joseph Hyatt. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous.